the hanging moment of weightlessness with direction as the drop frame pierces atmosphere, microgravity slipping away to a single, inexorable power, down, and every terror waiting there, a long fall, a long fall, a long, long fall, the ringing whine of a shell's eruption, the soft rain of churned earth to your helm, the heat shimmer on your chassis' fusion bleed-out. The world comes back to focus in the voice of your off-site CO, screaming at you to get up, to keep moving, to not stop. The unsettling jitter. The atemporal pause recognized pause of a loop closed by force. You, and then you once more. But no, really you this time. Snap out of it. A basilisk. A hostile mimetic. Fear. There it is. A real feeling. At the ontologic weapon that nearly killed you. There are monsters here. You rack the bolt on your SOL, eject a steaming power core, and slam a new one in. Your turn to fight back. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your Gaming Monk for the evening. As I've developed this series, I've evolved a style that I didn't originally intend. At first, it was the traditional is this good and is this not good metric that you'd see on Metacritic or the style substance rating system used on RPG Net. Time has shifted that into being more of a tailor than a reviewer in the typical sense. By that, I'm more interested in who would I recommend this to instead of a linear metric. This is why I get a bit hesitant when asked for recommendations of a good mecha RPG. Because mecha as a whole is not the one-size-fits-all that question entails. Gundam has its roots in power armor introduced in novels like Starship Troopers, with aspects of the super robot motifs pioneered by Go Nagai. Meanwhile, the likes of Battletech has more roots in tank designs, and a series like Macross is arguably in the middle of those two. To say nothing of how the super robot genre has evolved over the decades, creating its own direction with giant robots. Subsequently, the RPGs that adapt mecha are varied to cover these subtypes, so telling me mecha tells me relatively little. So where does today's review in Lancer fit into this? Well, it's intended to be a happy medium between the grit and the gonzo. Comparisons have been made to anime like Armor Trooper Votoms or Gundam Iron-Blooded Orphan. In the power armor tank scaling, it tends to lean towards the former. How does it hold up? Let's find out. At 430 pages, Lancer is a well-packed book that carries a degree of DNA from the creator's previous work, Kill Six Billion Demons. Their sense of detail and lived-in structure is very much apparent in Lancer's self-proclaimed mud and lasers style. What helps further this is a use of the three colors throughout the books. Red, white, and black. This contrast and use of a thicker font than in other books keeps text from blending in or causing eye strain. If I have one nitpick, it has to do with placement of certain mechanical pieces. I'm not the biggest fan of the compendium chapter that carries the bulk of the material's crunch, and a few in-review sections could certainly help matters. While the book does have an index, it doesn't have a character sheet in the back. Bottom line, it's a strong presentation with a few held-tilting moments. Much like Battle Century G, Lancer's character creation system is split between pilot and mecha. The difference here is that the former directly feeds into the latter. We'll be exploring this with our pilot in Esphonia Gilboat, also known by her call sign, Daybreak. The first step is background, where the pilot came from in terms of occupation or social status. We'll be going with Noble in this case, and each background grants four points for triggers, which are phrases that reflect the character and add a plus two, four, or six to a particular skill check. We'll be spending these on read a situation, stay cool, assault, and lead or inspire. Second is pilot talents, akin to feats in other games that reflect your skill in mecha piloting. We have three points to spend on talents, each being split into three tier chains. I'll go with tier one talents for duelist, vanguard, and leader talents. Third is mech skills, which act akin to a traditional skill system with ranks. 
These skills are used to determine the classes of mecha that a pilot is more adept at, well, piloting. There are four mech skills to choose from. Hull for heavy mechs, agility for evasive mechs, systems for technical mechs, and engineering for support mechs. Of these, we have two points to place in skills. We'll go with one each in hull and agility. Fourth, equipment. We can choose one armor, up to two weapons, and three other gear. For armor, we'll go with a hard suit. For weapons, we'll go with a combat alloy weapon and a signature combat weapon. And lastly, for gear, we'll go with a smart scope, as well as data plating and two fragmentation grenades. It counts as one slot. The final step for pilot creation is derived stats. With a license level of 0, her HP is 6, her armor defense and evasion is 10, and her speed is 4. Of course, this is only the first part of the equation. Next comes the actual mecha. Now you know how I said that pilot creation feeds into mecha creation? Well, this is where that Chekhov-sized gun goes off. A pilot has a license level that determines the mecha that they can utilize. Given how mecha frames can effectively be 3D printed, having the license to a mech is more important than having the funds to build one. Now at license level 0, the only one that a pilot can access is the GMS Everest, a balanced mech that's effectively the starter for every pilot. This also comes with a core system in the GMS Hyperspec Fuel Injector. Now the core and the frame have their own set of traits. The former grants the initiative and replaceable parts traits, while the latter grants the power-up action, as each core has their own specialized action that they can utilize. Much of the mecha's stats are preset on the frame, which means our Everest here has a structure and reactor stress of 4, HP of 12, heat capacity of 6, repair capacity of 5, speed 4, evasion 9, e-defense of 8, a sensor range of 10, and a saving of 10. The bulk of its customization is within the loadout. In our case, we have a slot for the flexible weapon, meaning it can equip a main weapon and auxiliary weapon, or two auxiliary weapons, a main mount, and a heavy mount, as well as six points worth of system slots. For these respective slots, we'll go with a charged blade, a thermal pistol, a heavy charged blade, and a missile rack for weapons. For systems, we'll go with stable structure, rapid burst jump jet system, and turret drone. It should be noted that the mech skills a pilot have adds to the mech's core stats. Hull can add to HP and repair capacity. Agility adds to evasion and speed. Systems add to E-Defense, Tech Attacks, as well as System Slots. And Engineering can add to Heat Capacity and the uses of limited systems. Mecha customization might appear restrictive at first, but I'd say that's looking at the forest for the trees. The mecha alone does not determine the proverbial sandbox. It's a combination of the pilot's skills, the traits of the core in the frame, and the traits that the pilot brings. In the case of this particular build, the Everest leans more towards a close-range leader-type mecha, where others might allow for more offensive or more defensive tactics. That said, the issue I have is placement. Once again, moving everything to the compendium in the back, and having pilot talents placed in the mech section is not something I'm keen on. It's not bad, but it is... different. A common summary I've seen of Lancer's mechanics is Shadow of the Demon Lord meets D&D 4th Edition. To an extent, that is certainly true. Lancer's core mechanic is a 1d20 roll, where the default difficulty is 10. This is primarily modified by accuracy and difficulty dice, both d6s that add or subtract their highest result to the d20 roll and cancel each other out. For example, a roll that has 2 accuracy would roll a d20 and 2d6, adding the highest results of the two six-siders to the d20 roll. The exception to this is skills and triggers, which add a static bonus instead of an advantage. Now, combat is grid-based, but using hexes instead of squares a la Battletech. Initiative is popcorn-based instead of a specific turn order, but individual turns operate on an economy of actions. Each character gains one move action and two quick actions, or one full action. A mecha can take an additional quick action at the cost of one heat, which is known as an over overcharge. If you try this again on the same turn, you instead lose 1d3 heat instead of just one heat, or 1d6 heat on the third time, and 1d6 plus 4 every time after that. While combat can be lethal with the fact that only a few clean hits can down a mech, 
It's not like a wound system directly. When a mech reaches 0 HP, you take 1 structure damage and roll a number of d6s to determine the effects of structure damage. Mirroring this, when you run out of heat capacity, you roll d6s on the overheating table. Either way, HP is restored after resolving structure damage, and heat is restored after a rest. Furthermore, lasting damage can be recovered using repair capacity. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the character manager for Lancer, known as CompCon. Not only is it a great character creation and advancement tool, but it's also really good at managing character sheets and their relative stats. I'd highly recommend giving it a look. In the alignment scaling between Grit and Gonzo, Lancer sits itself firmly in the middle. In the same vein, while customization is the name of its game, not going freeform works in its favor. It's a simple basis built around the core of the Rule of Ten. If you've built a background around level-based games, you'll have an easier time than those who've built their background in freeform games. Just remember that leveling increases your potential pool of options instead of being a series of decisions. That said, I have mixed feelings about moving so much of the crunchier parts, especially the mecha, into that compendium chapter. I know I've said that for the third time here, but I want to make that clear. The same goes for pilot abilities not being listed in pilot creation. I like to keep creation chapters self-contained, if at all possible. In addition, I think the game could do with adding a wider bestiary over the modular setup that the game presents. Given the strength of the world presented in the setting, I feel that it should demonstrate the threats potentially within it. A sample adventure in the core book couldn't hurt either. Even with that, I feel confident in giving Lancer a stamp of strongly recommended. While it might be a harder sell if people are more used to freeform style mech games like Mechton, or if they prefer creating their own setting since Lancer is rooted in his particular setting, I know quality when I see it, and anyone who's a fan of giant robots owes it to themselves to dive into this one. 